It is Oakland Zoo and Cocktails and Conservation. I'm Amy. I am glad you're joining us. Come on over. Grab your cocktail. We are getting together. This is Amy. I'm the VP of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. And you're our guest. We're glad to have you. We're going to be talking about wildlife especially grizzly bears. So it's one of my favorite species. I'm so excited. Um, and as I always say, what a joy it is to share this world with wildlife. It's, it's amazing. When you think about an animal like a grizzly bear, it's kind of unbelievable, really. I mean, imagine this animal. We share the world with this animal. And it's amazing, but it's also challenging. So luckily, we get to talk to heroes from around the world um, who are doing amazing things to help animals, and we get to join in what they're doing and get together. So I'm really glad you're joining us for A Shot of Hope with Cocktails and Conservation. Watching Cocktails and Conservation, where we rendezvous with inspiring wildlife conservation leaders from around the planet hear their stories, learn how they protect the animals we love, and how each of us can help them. With our featured custom cocktail, together we toast to Taking Action for Wildlife. All right, welcome back to Cocktails and Conservation, where we meet with wildlife heroes from around the world. We listen to their stories, we join their solutions, we have a refreshing beverage with people like you who want to connect, want to learn, want to take action, be part of the solution. And um, it's a great thing. I'm Amy Gottliff. I am your host today. Um, this is coming from the Oakland Zoo. Um, this is our way of gathering. Can't do it live quite yet, but this is our way to do it safe, to build community, to support bars and restaurants, um, to learn about issues, learn about animals, meet heroes, be part of their solutions, um, and to really meet people like you. Um, we're so glad to be together and it's interactive. So um, if you're down for all of that, a lovely hour together, um, why don't you say hello in the comments, let us know who you are, where are you tuning in from? How did you find out about this? I see people I know, which is so great. I see languages I don't know, which is also so great. All right, and most importantly, if you wanna mix up your grizzly berry, old fashioned, created by the Hobnob and Alameda, it'll be in the chat if you haven't done it already. Hi, Diane, hi, Conrad. All right, tonight, um, we have Mark Beal. He's the Natural Resources Program Manager for Glacier National Park. That is a ridiculously cool job. We're really excited to talk to him. Um, he's warming up. I know he got all of his ingredients for his cocktail, so I'm pretty excited. And I'm going to throw a question out there. And the question is, have you ever seen a wild bear? Um, any kind of bear. Black bear, grizzly bear, polar bear. Have you ever seen a wild bear? Where was it? Um, I love to hear these stories. Okay, and while you're getting on there and telling us this, um, I wanna welcome everybody from Facebook, YouTube, Oakland Zoo staff and Friends of the Wild, volunteers, um, anyone in the conservation community, we love you. Anyone who loves grizzlies, come on over. Um, any friends of Mark's and his dog Gracie and Glacier National Park, we are so glad that you're here. All right, here we go. Our guest is Mark Beal. He I told you his title, it's long, the Natural Resources Program Manager for Glacier National Park. Mark's been in the, the national park world for like almost three decades. He'll tell you about it. He's worked at all kinds of different parks. He's won awards for the cool things he's done, some really, really cool stuff. We're gonna hear about that too. Um, it's so great to have just a cool person who's dedicated their life to parks and these animals and um, and we get them for a full hour. So welcome, Mark. Yeah. There you are. And you're muted. How's that? <laughs> <You're> quiet, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> um, welcome, Mark. 
Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Uh, yeah, you're live on Cocktails and Conservation, and we're so glad to have you. And I must say, I love your shirt with the turtles on it. Thank you very much. You like a lot of different animals. <laughs> totally. Worked with a lot of different kinds of animals in my career, yeah. Awesome. I love it. Um, and where are you right now? I'm actually sitting in my kitchen. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, and have you been working from that kitchen for a lot of this lovely COVID experience or in and out of the park? What's what's your year been like, Mark? Yeah, pretty much working from the kitchen table up until around uh, early May. And then I spend the summer working in the park where we can respond to any issues that go on with wildlife. And then come October, November, I'm, I'm back in the kitchen, so. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, well, it's a nice kitchen. <laughs> um, we like right. it. So then what about the park itself? Like what's been going on in the park in this last year? So in the last year, the park has just been trying to uh, get a handle on COVID. Um, you know, half the park was shut down last summer um, be because of COVID. And so we were trying to deal with, um, you know, lots of visitation um, reduce staff, uh, trying to figure out, you know, park housing. We couldn't have as many people in park housing as we had in the past. And, um, you know, not, not the same number of people could drive in the vehicle. You used to be able to get four people in a vehicle could only have two. So there were some challenges, but we, uh, we're a resourceful crew and we figured it out. I think that's what a lot of people are figuring out this year is like, bonding actually with their coworkers and coming up with creative stuff. I can only imagine. So it's not funny, but I have to laugh a little bit. So many people who aren't typical tourists were like flocking to the parks. So for someone who's trying to educate for people to be in the park in the right way, it must have been madness, especially when you had less lot like less staff to deal with that. Yeah, it was pretty challenging. We definitely saw a different um different category of uh, park user. I think, you know, people weren't able to travel internationally. And so I think a lot of people decided it was a good time to buy a, buy a camper or a tent and visit a national park or a state park. And, um, you know, not nothing against them. They probably never done it before, but they didn't know thing one about how to camp or food security or anything like that. And, uh, so there were a lot of, a lot of challenges that way. And, um, you know, the, the visitor we get is pretty, um, you know, they, don't, they spend a limited amount of time here. It's not like they're here for three weeks or a month. So it was like almost every day you were getting new people and having to re-educate and the same message over and over again. So it was, uh, it was challenging, but it was good to see people coming out and enjoying their parks and, uh, and yeah. nature. So it was good. Yeah. So. <laughs> I know that's what everyone I know was thinking to do. So um, all right. Well, um, quick announcements. Um, if you want to check out any of our past cocktails and conservation shows, we did 11 of them already on all kinds of different animals. You can go to a link that should be in the chat um, and watch some past ones when you got some time. And we have four more after this. They all focus on the illegal wildlife trade. So that's our big focus at the Oakland Zoo for the rest of the year um, with <clears throat> a focus on chimpanzees, pangolins, moon bears, and elephants. So hopefully you'll stick with us. But today the issue is grizzly bears. And, um, you know, it's a pretty important topic to us um, at, at Oakland Zoo um, and in California because we have grizzly bears, but they represent an animal that we don't have anymore. So they were really abundant in California at one time. Um, the different decisions people made um, out of fear and misunderstanding has caused them to be extirpated in our world. And I know I read that there's somewhere around 50,000 grizzly bears, most of them in Alaska. Is that right? Yeah. There's a small amount in the lower 48 and most of them are in Montana. So you've got a really important job when it comes to grizzly bears. Pretty key. You're kind of right there in the hot spot. Yeah. So we're excited to learn about you. And um, let's just share the embarrassing photo, which is part of our process, which is really cute. Um, so <laughs> let's learn about you, Mark. What's going on in this photo? 
So that was probably uh, back in the early 90s when I was just starting at Yellowstone National Park in the bear management office. And um, we were receiving a, a management bear from uh, the state of Wyoming and uh, getting ready to relocate it into the park. And so we were getting the ear tags and radio collar on it and taking the um, body measurements from it and just as much information as we can get you know, from an animal like that, that you don't get your hands on very often. And uh, so that was uh, wow. a young Mark sporting the park service trucker hat and looking pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you do look pretty good. Um, it's amazing in the chat how many people have had a bear interaction or they've seen them. So cool. thanks everybody for, for doing that safely. Um, so Mark, okay, so you started with bears, you've got sea turtles on your shirt. What what are the parks you work with? Like what's the span since that photo? So in Yellowstone, I was there for 12 years from 92 to 2004. And then we went down to uh, Bryce Canyon National Park in Southern Utah. And we worked with uh, Utah Prairie Dogs and Ringtail Cats down there. Those are pretty cool critters. Wow. And uh, from there, we went to South Texas down to Padre Island National Seashore. And uh, so I got to work a little with the sea turtles down there, hence this shirt uh, that I got when I left there. And uh, from Padre, we went up to uh, Devil's Tower National Monument in uh, Northeast Wyoming. And we're there for several years before we came to, um, to Glacier, so. That's amazing. Yeah. And here's, here's an animal that's not a bear. It's a goat. That would so, be a mountain goat, yep. That's a mountain goat, which, God, they're amazing. So you've done a lot of work with mountain goats, including one, a, a lovely award for your work with them, correct? So tell us quickly about that before we get to the bears. So I assume you're talking about Gracie. Yep. Yeah. So part of the uh, findings, we were looking at why the mountain goats and uh, bighorn sheep hang out around so many people at Logan Pass, because it's like a small city up there on a busy day. And uh, goats and sheep are just, people and goats and sheep are on top of each other. And so we were trying to figure out why. And one of the things we learned, and I believe the grad students actually on this call. So if you are, hello, Wesley, and I hope I do you <laughs> proud on this one. Um, one of the things we learned was, you know, the that the, the main reason they're up there, the goats and sheep hanging out, is that there's so many people that it, it creates a somewhat of a predator-free zone. Mm. And so we were trying to find ways that we could better manage the people and the wildlife that were getting too close together. And one of the things I thought of was maybe we could reintroduce a, a predator to the equation. And so I came up with the idea of using Gracie, as you can see in this picture here. She's a Now she's a six-year-old border collie. Um, but uh, to us, she's a cute, fuzzy little dog. And we were hoping to the sheep and the goats that they would perceive her as a predator. And um, surprisingly, that's what happened. Uh, you know, we are able to use her to move the goats and sheep just far enough away that people can still see them in a natural habitat, can watch them with binoculars, can take pictures with them. They're just not interacting right on top of them, you know, and trying to touch them or pet them or feed them, which is a bad idea. Um, and so, yeah, I do that with Gracie and the, the wildlife hazing is done probably in 30 seconds. And then we spend the next uh, three hours and 55 minutes talking with people and reminding them, educating them how to act appropriately around, around wildlife that's uh, safe for them and safe for the wildlife. So. All right. Well, I, I uh, coached you that we'd only talk about problems first, then we drink, then we talk about solutions. But I had to get into Gracie because it's just such a part of your background. And anytime I Googled you to find out more, there she was. And congrats on that award. That's super amazing. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, let's talk about Glacier. So I was just going to ask you what it's like to work in such an amazingly glorious park like this. It's well. As you can tell by the pictures you're posting there, it's a pretty horrible place to work. Um, it's really tough to get to the office and get out of bed in the morning. Uh, no, it's a great place. There's always something different, even if you go to the same place like we did when we were trying to capture goats up at Logan Pass. You know, we would go up there, you know, two weeks straight trying to catch them. And every day you went up there, you saw something different. It was the same location, but it was almost like a different location every time. 
And uh, so there's, yeah, it's just unparalleled beauty. Uh, the scenery is just incredible, nice, clean air, clean water. And we have an incredible um, complement of, um, uh, of ungulates, uh, predator and prey species, basically. We have almost every single animal that was present when Lewis and Clark came through the area, except for bison and antelope on the east side. So we're working pretty cool. <laughs> um, wow, that it's just amazing. Um, all right, let's talk grizzly. So I believe this is a picture of one of the grizzlies at Oakland Zoo, which I'll tell you more about when we talk more about problems. But what is it that draws you to grizzlies? Well, just look at them. I mean, they are. They're the epitome of, um, of wilderness, of power, and for such a big animals, you know, surprisingly grace too. They're just, uh, you, you see one moving on the landscape and uh, it's, it's something that you're never gonna forget. I'm kind of peeking at some of the comments here and, you know, a lot of people have seen them, you know, all over the place. And, uh, and you know, as you can tell, they haven't forgotten it. It's just very cool, you know, they're, Along with the mountain goat, you know, they're probably one of the most iconic species of wilderness and of uh, nat national parks and other wild areas, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I think these are ours too, but um, it is amazing that people still feel so much fear around it too. Like there, there's just this innate, I mean, I understand, but what do you say to people like that who, that's the first thing they bring up is, is fear. Yeah. So surprisingly I run into that a lot. Um, you know, there's people that come to the park wanting to camp and then they find out there's bears in the park. And then next thing you know, they're on their phone trying to find a hotel. Oh geez. And it's like, you know, why are you doing that? This is a great place to camp. And you know, they're mm -hmm. like, it's like you said, I think they're, they're afraid. I think a lot of it is, um, is ignorance. And I don't mean that in the bad connotation. I just mean like lack of, um, understanding of the animal of um you know what drives them and mm -hmm. that if you you know there's a there's a few out few easy for me to say there's a few <laughs> rules you can follow i haven't even sampled the the drink yet so um <laughs> that's the problem there's a few you know simple rules you can follow and if you follow those your chance of a you know a bad encounter with a grizzly bear um you know is very small and you know i, I I see his comment again here on the side, but Wesley, who is the grad student on the GOAT project, he works for the state of Montana now as a bear management um, specialist. So he's actually in the in the thick of it out there on the yeah. eastern front, east of the park, working with the grizzly bears. And it's a lot of education mm -hmm. um, that, you know, kind of gets you people over that hump to not be afraid. So, yeah. But they are, they're big animals. They're intimidating. Yeah, you you don't want to see one in a dark cool. alley. Exactly. Um, Okay. Yeah. I had that people are more likely to get struck by lightning than attacked by a bear, but still, you know, it's not a logical feeling, I suppose, but mm -hmm. it's probably a big part of the education. All right. So the grizzly bears, what are they doing now in their cycle? Like what is their cycle and what here, you know, April 14th, what are they, what, what are they up to? They are for the most part, just uh, starting to wake up from their winter, winter sleep winter hibernation. And um, we actually had a report of a grizzly bear with a yearling in the uh, many glacier valley just from yesterday. So they are out and about in the park and in the local area. And that's a cute picture. I like that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're, uh, so they're out and about. So they're, um, you know, they've been uh, basically kind of, you know, quasi dormant now since, you know, October, November, December, depending on, you know, mm -hmm. their life cycle they were in, you know, whether they had cubs or not, or if they were an adult male. And so they're coming out and they're getting their bearings and they're going to be hungry and they're looking for food. And uh, yeah, so they're covering a lot of ground. They can definitely and is cover there a, a lot of ground. That they eat a certain thing at this time of year and a certain something else. Yeah, a lot of it depends on, um, you know, kind of the ecosystem they're in. Like uh, when I worked in Yellowstone, when they would come out of hibernation, one of the main food sources they would target would be uh, winter killed ungulates like bison or elk that were just too weak to make it through the season. And they would okay. congregate in the thermal areas. And when the bears wake up, there's just a smorgasbord of, you know, dead meat on the landscape <laughs> that they can eat. But up here in Glacier, we don't have that. So... Wow. 
they're looking for, you know, uh, forbs and grasses that are just starting to green up and try mm -hmm. and get that, you know, nutrition into their system. And, um, you know, there might be, you know, dead animal on the landscape, but I just don't think it's probably to the quantity that, you know, we would see down in Yellowstone. So, yeah, got it. Um, and then are they affected by climate change then? Are there cycles? Are you seeing changes and challenges due to the climate? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the things we're seeing is, you know, that we, we, we've had some cold winters, but we don't have the, the really cold, you know, sub-zero for two or three weeks, you know, like the old timers around here talk about. Hmm. So the, the winters are getting a little, we'll call them easier, I guess. You know, we still get some of the sub-zero weather. But, um, you know, we are seeing some of the, the bigger males um, that, you know, don't hibernate if they don't have to. The only reason they hibernate is because there's, you know, it's not because of the cold. It's because there's, uh, it's lack of food. Um, so as long as there's food around in the form of, you know, dead animals or whatever, they can scrounge up, you know, whether it's uh, garbage or other things that people leave laying around, then there's no need for them to hibernate. So, Got it. Hmm. Okay, so let's start to talk about some of their issues. Climate, yes, but obviously us <laughs> and the other things we cause. So what how what about roads and cars and trains? This is an issue. Yeah, so you know, we've been seeing just incredible visitation. It's it's gone up almost every single year since I got here in 2010. And you know, our biggest year of visitation just in Glacier alone was over 3 million visitors. And with the visitors come the cars driving on roads like this. And so the the roads, you know, usually bisect, you know, some prime grizzly bear habitat, making it difficult for bears to get, you know, from one part of their home range to the other. Um, some bears are very wary of roads and don't want to be close to them. Others are quite comfortable around roads. Mm -hmm. And with the volume of traffic we've been getting, you know, that leads to, you know, potential uh, bear vehicle collisions, which usually doesn't end well for the bear or the vehicle. Um, and then, you know, we get, again, so many people that, you know, people, for whatever reason, see a bear and think that the poor thing is starving and they try and feed it, which is illegal to do. Um, but um, yeah, so it's a, it's a lot of that, a lot of the challenges like that and, um, you know, con mm -hmm. habitat connectivity and just the, yeah, getting hit by cars is bad. And, um, you know, along the southern boundary of the park is, a, you know, a railroad track and a river and a road all right next to the park border. And, you know, and this is a picture of a black bear that was taken, or uh, sorry, grizzly bear that was taken at uh, Many Glacier Campground. And um, trying to remember the story on that one, I think it was uh, – guy was fishing and decided he was going to clean his fish on his picnic table and did so and left backpacks and everything else out and bears have an incredible sense of smell and so the you know bear that just happened to be passing through you know smelled a smelled a food reward and came in and uh so luckily on this one i believe we we're able to uh, use aversive conditioning on him and get out of there but uh but it's a big challenge you know food security is mm -hmm. is big and as we get more people moving here from areas that aren't used to dealing with you know bears of any kind let alone grizzly bears you know they don't know they need to keep um you know dog food or garbage secure so we're seeing more and more of that Whew. um so for those that don't know we have four grizzly bears at the oakland zoo two grizzly two brown brothers all from alaska and they're, they're, both their moms were put to sleep because they were became nuisance bears. They came into territories um, near people, and it was because of you know garbage and food out. Um, and that's why we have the bears that we have. Um, we're glad to have them, but yep, that is definitely the situation. Um, all right, so Mark, you gave me a map, and the map's going to help us better understand an issue. Mm -hmm this lovely cool photo you have and this is above the grizzly your area grizzly area and what story does the map tell us so that's the you can see a little pin down there kind of in the bottom middle of yeah. the photo and that's the uh, goat lick uh, overlook area there's a the highway two runs that's that white line you can kind of see that makes a u-shape around the southern boundary of the park 
Got everything it. above that line is Glacier National Park uh, to a certain extent, and everything south of that is uh, Forest Service lands. Um, but yeah, it's prime grizzly bear habitat and U.S. Highway 2 running through there. It's the main east-west corridor. And like I mentioned, there's a river just down the slope from the highway. And then on the other side of the river, you know, there's a, a main east-west um, tra train track thoroughfare running through there. And so there's, uh, again, a lot of traffic on the road, a lot of traffic increasing on the train tracks. And, um, you know, we're seeing more and more people, um, you know, coming to the area to recreate. So we're actually seeing more and more people on the rivers. And so with, you know, you combine all that activity of people floating the river and having a good time and yelling and having fun and all these uh, trucks and vehicles and campers going by on Highway 2 and trains. And that really limits the opportunity for bears to cross uh, from the park onto the forest or vice versa. So because a lot of the bears we have don't they don't just stay in the park and they don't just stay on the forest. You know, they bears know no boundaries. They go where they want. So Got it. All right. So that definitely paints the picture of what we're seeing here. Um, this goat lick yeah. overpass is a big a part of our story together, which we're excited to tell people about. But what is happening here? There's highway and people and goats. Yeah. So you can probably see the goats down there just at the bottom of the bridge. And, um, yeah, that bridge was built specifically to allow uh, wildlife to pass underneath it uh, without having to get on the roadway and uh, becoming um, a red spot. So, um, but what it does, it's uh, it's a really good place for people to see mountain goats. And so people will stop in the middle of the road or get out and you'll find them, you know, sitting on the bridge like they are or they're actually here stopped on the road, walking under the bridge, trying to, you know, there's a goat right there that you can kind of see near the pillar. Yeah. Um, and they just, they just get so excited that, you know, they, they kind of get down there. They don't realize that um, all that activity and presence tends to prevent wildlife from wanting to use that area then. So. So they in general just avoid the whole passage that you've made for them the way it currently is. For certain times of the day, yeah. And, um, you know, we're trying to get a handle on, you know, if more and more goats are just starting to avoid it as well as other wildlife um, or if they're, they use it at different times of the day that we don't. So we'll have cameras, uh, remote cameras put out there that uh, will take pictures all hours of the day when an animal crosses a beam. And so, you know, we can uh, keep track of use that way. So. Okay. All right. So I'm getting to know the problem. Um, we're going to take one question before we go to our drink from Diane Bennett. I will just share it here. I knew someone would ask this. What kind of aversive conditioning do you use to discourage the grizzly? Yeah, good question. So um, that bear that was in the campground. Uh, well, first of all, let me back up. There's several techniques we can use and that ranges from, we always try and start with the lowest level of uh, force necessary to move the bear. So that just starts out with people yelling and clapping. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's enough to get a bear to turn around and run out of an area. And if, if that doesn't work, then we go to um, other noise making, um, you know, rocks in a can or some other type of thing, sirens on a patrol vehicle that will potentially scare the bear away. And if that doesn't work, then we step it up even more. And we have actually projectiles that you can shoot out of a shotgun. Mm -hmm. And one of them is... Uh, like a, a, bean, a little tiny bean bag that, you know, you aim for a large muscle mass like the hip and you try and hit the bear there. And basically what you're doing is you're inflicting pain, trying to teach it that it's not a place where it wants to be. Uh, another technique is, you know, a rubber bullet that does the same thing or a cracker shell, which is like a little tiny firecracker that you fire out of the shotgun. And then it explodes in the air between you and the bear. And then hopefully the noise scares it away and then it runs away that way. So those are all kind of tools in the toolbox that we can use to uh, manage bears that way. So. All right. Well, thanks for the question. We're going to talk more about solutions after we take this break. Um, so Mark, I know you got your ingredients together. You made your drink. Uh, tell, well, maybe you'll tell us afterwards. I know this is the trivia question for everybody. The recipe calls for blueberries. What berry do you think Mark used instead of blueberries, considering where he lives? 
we'll tell you after the drink. Um, this drink is made by the Hobnob. It's the cutest little cafe in Oakland. Been there a long time. They have delicious, like California style food, very comforting. They've got like cute outdoor cafes or inside right now. So we're excited to hear all about this drink. Here we go. Hello, my name is Scott Herway, and today I'm at the Hobnob in Alameda at 1313 Park Street. Um, it's a restaurant that my wife and I have owned for about 14 years, serving American comfort food. And today I'm going to make the Grizzly Berry Old Fashioned. And what has kind of inspired me to make this drink are the, um, just the ingredients that I would think would be indigenous in force, the natural environment to where the Grizzly bear lives, um, blueberries, and the herbaceousness of the sage. And um, it's pretty simple. Um, you just want to make sure that you have a stirring spoon um, or something to stir with, and a muddler. And um, the ingredients are the, the blueberries, the sage, uh, bitters. We're, uh, we're going to use uh, Agostura bitters today, uh, blood oranges. And uh, the bourbon I chose today is a Woodward, Woodford Reserve. All right, so first we're gonna mix the ingredients and then muddle. So we're gonna take about, you know, I don't know, eight or nine blueberries. Put those in there. And about five leaves of the sage. and two slices of blood orange. Um, about an uh, ounce and a half of simple syrup, or uh, you can add sugar. And about four dashes of bitters. And, um, Let's see, a splash, a splash of soda, just to kind of break down the ingredients. And then we muddle. Just to make sure you get it all sort of purified. Mixed together. All right, and then we're gonna add a little bit of ice. And then about two ounces of bourbon. So, so we're gonna add our whipped reserve. There's one ounce. And two ounces. All right. And you add a little bit more ice. Not too much. And then we stir. Mix it all together. All right. And then you just uh, pour over ice. Very slowly. Make sure you get it all. Purified fruit is going to seep through a little bit. And then we're going to put our garnish on, a couple leaves of the sage, and an edible flower. And that is the grizzly berry old fashioned. All right, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Do you have a Michigan State cup just for me? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were a greenie. Go Spartans. Um, this is good. Go green. All right. It's very good. Cheers, everybody. Oh, yeah. They're pretty smart, Mark. I don't think you had anyone fooled. What was the berry? 
It was Huckleberry. Huckleberry. Yeah. Um, delish. Thank you um, to Hobnob. All right. So we're going to start talking. Wait, we have to do a special toast for you. I'm sorry, Mark. Everyone pick up your glasses. Here's our toast. To, a to taking action for wildlife, to Mark a big bear hug. Let's do this together. Now chug a lug. Okay, so we're gonna start talking about solutions. Um, I don't know where you begin to help grizzly bears. So my main question was, is there an overall grizzly bear plan that you guys plug into? Yeah, so each agency when the grizzly bear was listed as a threatened species back in the 70s was required to come up with a management plan, uh, basically outlining how that agency would manage the, the bear um, depending on the different mandates and missions that those agencies have. So we were able to come up, you know, we have our plan uh, that outlines what we do from education to food security, um, you know, all the way down to scheduling when dumpsters get emptied. Um, and yeah, so there's the, the overarching plan that kind of outlines, you know, how we deal with the bear, or I shouldn't say deal with the bear, you know, bears deal with us. Um, manage the bear, you know, when uh, situations arise, you know, whether that's a bear on a carcass in a backcountry trail or a campground or, you know, like the, the bear on the table that we saw earlier. So, mm -hmm. Okay. So we know you do the aversions. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'm going to show a map again, and I don't know if this can help illustrate some of how you've made your plans. This is another map you gave me that's just kind of cool. <laughs> um, had to show that one. So like, do you look at this map and make your plans accordingly? I think in a way, you know, we, we made the plan based, like I said, on our mission and mandate. But if you look at that map and all the different colors on there, those are all different land management agencies, whether it's state or a non-government organization or tribal okay, um, or U S forest service, fish and wildlife, whatever. So you, you kind of do have to look at the map and you have to see where your, um, where your plan can maybe mesh or help out an adjoining landowner because, you know, like I mentioned earlier, bears don't know boundaries. And, um, you know, you kind of want to have a, a unified approach on how you do it. If, you know, you're doing one thing for a bear in a campground in the park, you know, or vice versa, it's nice that the same thing is going on with the bear if it enters a campground in a different jurisdiction. So. So you have to get so many different minds and stakeholders together that have maybe different motivations. Mm -hmm. So are you using like, <laughs> like forms of psychology to see like what are different motivations or for everyone to feel that they're part of something? Seems yeah, so there's an overarching interagency grizzly bear committee that has representatives from all of the different um, governmental and non-governmental agencies on there um, that have a voice in the management of the grizzly bear. Um, just to make sure that everybody's heard, um, you know, and it, you know, it's hard for some people because, you know, someone else, some other group's um, mandate might be a lot different than, you know, some, what someone else is trying to accomplish. But um, for the most part, it's worked out and, um, you know, everyone's working together and working hard to, to preserve the bear and make sure that it stays on the landscape for, you know, a long time to come. Okay. Awesome. Seems hard. Um, I love this. You gave this to me. It just shows that underpasses can work. Little video. <laughs> um, so do you do you guys work to make these underpasses or make the plans around them? Yeah, so any road project that goes on in the park, um, anywhere that we could, we tried to upsize our culverts just for that reason that you showed in that video so that wildlife whether it's a bear or a mountain lion or a coyote or a wolf or whatever can can get safely across the road without having to get on the road and possibly hit and then we're seeing more and more uh, a lot more states and other uh, local agencies here anyways uh, are looking at different ways to try and get wildlife underpasses or overpasses uh, put into place um, you know, one of the things we hear is that they're, oh, they're so expensive, but if you look at, you know, how much, uh, cost road killed wildlife, you know, 
it inflicts on the economy, I guess we'll say, you know, just from property damage to lost lives or injuries to people. Um, you know, those overpasses and underpasses, you know, kind of start looking pretty reasonable. So absolutely. Um, all right. And then Mark, I, I can't believe I don't know this, but are you guys studying them too? Like, how do you, are you track? I know you use some cool technology to track them with a geofence project, but are you collaring or is it, how how do you track how do you keep track of these guys Coming yeah so part of the recovery plan for all the agencies in our area is you know we do a pop you know trend monitoring for the grizzly bears in the northern continental divide ecosystem which is what we are part of um we try and keep at least 10 bears 10 grizzly bears collared in glacier and then the other land management agencies around us try and maintain a certain number of collars and their gps collars so that we can uh for the most part, yeah, on some of them, you can actually log on your computer and see where that bear is at um, and, you know, and track it. But you can you get a download of a file where you can see all the places this bear has been over time. And, um, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, John Waller, he's our bear management specialist in Glacier National Park. He, he got his um, doctoral thesis looking at connectivity on Highway 2. And um, we're actually... You know, he predicted that there would be a, a time, you know, when there would be so much traffic that it might become a hindrance for bears to cross. And I, I think we're kind of getting to that point now because wow. we can see some of the grizzly bear collar data that shows bears approaching the roads and then, you know, either stopping where they're at or turning around and going another way or laying low until it's dark, <clears throat> excuse me, until it's dark. And then they can uh, cross at nighttime when um, traffic is, you know, tends to be a little lower lower volume so okay um and then it seems like well one of the hardest things you have to do is is educate and change behaviors so if you're trying to get grizzlies to like amble on their way you know under the highway over the highway not encounter people um and to and to have people really help in that way that seems like the trickiest part it's it's the trickiest and it's also the most important. Yeah. Um, we could we every, every day if we had to we could go out and throw cracker shells or rubber bullets at a bear that was getting into you know garbage or something let's say or unsecured food and that's that but that's not addressing the problem or the issue and the issue is you know the the people leaving that out there so if we're able to educate the people to refrain from doing that inappropriate activity then you know surprise you know it makes your life easier and it stops drawing uh, bears into developed areas that puts them and people at risk so yeah human human education is a big one and it also you know we touched on it earlier helps overcome that um the fear of the unknown or you know helps helps you better understand it and what you understand and appreciate you're you're less likely to uh to treat poorly or try and get rid of so yeah um we had a question earlier is there a different thing you tell people when it comes to black bears and grizzly bears no both bears uh, both species in the park people are required to stay at least 100 yards away mm -hmm. um they both love you know garbage or unsecured food or bird seed or anything like that so you know, the, the garbage and food security messaging is the same for them. Um, and, you know, hiking too, no matter where you are, if you're in black bear or grizzly bear country, you know, just be loud. Um, you know, let, let them know you're there. Uh, be aware of your surroundings. If you're hiking along and all of a sudden you see, you know, a bunch of ravens hanging out next to the trail, you know, chances are there might be something dead there, but, you know, might have a bear sleeping nearby. So, um, you know, be aware of your surroundings and um, carry bear spray with you and know how to use it, have it easily accessible. So, Got it. Whew. Okay. Here's a question from David. He says, is any of the GPS Grizz data in the public domain? So that is a good question. That one, um, I know for us, our data goes right to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because they're the ones in charge of, um, we actually answer to them when it comes to the management of the grizzly bear. Um, I believe due to the sensitivity of the species and that if the data got out and there's some people out there that would do harm to the bear, 
Um, I believe that is not in the public domain. That's usually the case with all the camera traps yeah. and things like that for animals. We just want to make sure it stays mm -hmm. safe. Um, okay, so you're educating the public um, and you're making the underpasses. Let's talk about goat licks. So here, I'll let people know that Oakland Zoo really wanted to help Glacier with bears and this underpass is one of the main things that, that um, you guys let us know that we can support. Um, so what is it you're gonna do? So at Goat Lick, um, you know, one of those earlier photographs of the people sitting on the bridge, you can see on one side of the bridge, there was already wildlife fencing installed. But then that other photo you showed of the people, you know, coming off that bus on the highway and walking right under the bridge, there's no wildlife fencing on that side. So what we're going to be doing, yeah, that, that picture right there. So what we're going to be doing on that side of the bridge is we're going to be installing the same style of wildlife fencing to try and funnel the animals under the bridge, but keep the people out and therefore hopefully uh, increase the use of, um, of that underpass by all species of wildlife, not just the goats, but uh, bears, lions. Uh, we've seen deer uh, underneath there and coyotes and everything. So uh, that's that's what we're hoping for. So. Okay, and um, I, maybe I'll let you answer the question. Um, you know, we made this connection through a brand new initiative that we just signed on to called the Zoo Parks Partnership. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? You talked about how alliances really help, and this is a pretty cool one. It's a very cool one. Yeah, it's uh, it, yeah, we're one of the boy handful of national parks in the country right now that are part of a zoo to park partnership. And what that does is it um, helps the zoos and the parks leverage not only staffing, but funding um, and help out with projects like this, because if it were not for the Oakland Zoo doing fundraising for this, we wouldn't be able to, um, you know, afford the, the, the fence that we want to put up. Um, you know, there's additional work going on at the Goat Lick to make a, a longer and easier accessible um, uh, trail that people with disabilities can access to get a better view of the goats. And that's being funded by another friends group that we have, the Glacier National Park Conservancy. Um, all that together, you know, it's, um, it's helping out and making the project possible because the the days of anyone going it alone in conservation, you know, just due to budgets, whether it's federal, state, or private, are long over. And um, you know, what we have to do is rely on our, our partnerships and trying to leverage our funds as best we can with other groups. And um, this this has been working out great. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah, we're really excited. Um, all right, <laughs> I like Boyd's question. Um, hey, I've been looking for a charitable organization to support that's dedicated to grizzly bear conservation efforts. Um, I, you know, I'll just jump in, Boyd, and say, you know, if you want to um, donate to Oakland Zoo's efforts to um, try to collect as much as we can for this um, for this goat lick project, which could include besides the infrastructure signage and things like that, um, you can do that. But any other suggestions, Mark? Any of the, can you donate directly to the work you're doing besides the Goat Lick? Yeah, so you're not able to donate directly to the park, mm -hmm. but I mentioned the Glacier National Park Conservancy and that's the park's private fundraising partner. Um, so you should check them out online. They do um, an incredible job of funding everything from wildlife research. You know, they helped fund the, the mountain goat study um, they've done grizzly bear study, looking at grizzly bears and army cutworm moths as one of their main food sources in the fall. They do, they fund projects for, you know, I mentioned the trails for, you know, trails that are, you know, accessible for those with disabilities. And that's not just the goat, like that's through other areas of the park. And, um, um, they do, uh, amazing, um, tribal program, uh, Native American Speaks, where we actually get uh, tribal members from several of the tribes in the area that come to the park. Of course, they weren't able to do it last year, but if you're visiting the park or the area and you have a chance to see that, uh, it's amazing to see and hear their stories. And um, yeah, they, they tie you in, you know, to the night sky. And, you know, we have our own cultural 
connection to the dark sky, but to uh, hear the tribal connection, what it means to them is really interesting. So yeah, they do amazing work on that, you know, just like the Oakland Zoo does. So there's a lot of, a lot of good groups out there. So. Okay. I was just going to ask you before you went into it a little bit about the connection with um, any of your work in Blackfeet Nation community that we try to connect with on the bison projects. Um, are you working with them to secure bins or educate or yeah so we're we're trying to work with them to get um increase the number of uh bear proof dumpsters garbage cans uh, that they can use on the reservation again you know keeping that stuff away from bears is the best way to keep the bears safe and keep the people safe um we do you know amazing work with them um, you know, with the grizzly bears, you know, they're one of our partners in the uh, grizzly bear, you know, uh, management program with the IGBC. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're trying to get a research project going to study elk on the east side of the park that's related to the, the buff, you know, the bison program that, you know, they're trying to bring a, a free ranging herd of bison back to the landscape. And, you know, that that's apex herbivore that's been absent from the landscape for about 150 years. And the elk have kind of taken over that role. So how's when the bison come back, if they come back, how's that, how is that going to change you know, how the elk use the landscape? And so we're trying to figure, you know, that question out too. So it's a lot of, a lot of collaborative work. Again, they're, they're our next door neighbor, you know, and like I said, you can't, can't go it alone anymore. You can try, but you wind up looking foolish. So. <laughs> so Mark, what other, what else can you tell me that you're doing of all these things you've already told us that, that help the grizzly or other animals too. Yeah. So I think a lot of the work that mostly my staff has done, you know, with the federal highways program on the, the road projects going on in the park. Uh, one of them right now is over in many glacier, you know, we're doing the uh, redoing that whole road from uh, Bab, which is on the reservation into the many glacier hotel. And that's one of the areas we looked at where we identified, um, clusters of road killed wildlife. And then we look to see if in that area we can upsize, you know, upscale a, a culvert that would then allow for animals to pass through there instead of coming up over on the road. Uh, so that's, you know, one thing we've been doing there. Um, you know, we've been working with the state on highway two to try and get more overpasses or underpasses put on there, uh, again, to protect the wildlife and protect the people. Um, yeah. And then just, you know, again, you know, we mentioned it earlier, it's the, the education component that's it's an important part, not only for us, but, you know, zoos play an important part in that because, you know, you get people coming there and reading about the bears and thinking they're cool. And then, you know, maybe they come to visit Glacier or, you know, some other state park or national park and they remember it's like, oh, we can't just leave the garbage sitting on the picnic table. We have to take care of it. And, you know, we that education program is with, again, all our partners, the state, the tribe. NGOs, um, yeah, e everybody. So, okay, that's fantastic. Well, Laura's asked, you know, one of my favorite questions here that we always kind of wrap up with a little bit. Um, she asks, um, "What can an individual individual do to help and as grizzlies?" <laughs> so, if she's looking at, you know, helping specifically grizzly bears, then you know, if you live in grizzly bear country, then understand. Um, actions that you might be doing that might be detrimental to the bear or detrimental to you. Um, so, you know, make sure there's, you know, no dog food, no bird feeders in the summertime. I know that kills some people because they like to see it, but bears just love eating bird seed. It's a cheap, easy food source that's pretty nutritional for them. Um, keep your garbage secure. And if you, you know, if you don't live in an area, uh, you know, get involved with one of these local groups, whether it's the Oakland Zoo or the Glacier National Park Conservancy, and you can, um, you know, you can you can support you know research on the bears in the park, or you know, if there's a, um, I think I saw that you know Laura said she's in California. You know, you got Sequoia Kings Canyon in Yosemite, and they have black bears there, and you know maybe there's a friends group there. I'm not sure. Uh, you could look into it though, and um, you know support research or other you know, types of management actions in those areas that, you know, help the bear and help the people. So. Excellent. And I can see in the chat, um, we're putting links to how we'd like you to, you know, how Glacier would like you to behave when you visit, um, as well as 
Um, I think we have our own Living with Wildlife link that could go in the chat as well. And this would be a good time to say, also in the chat, we're gonna put a link to Cocktails and Conservation, the group itself. You can join that on Facebook and you'll get to see you know, updates on when our next events are. And um, Mark, okay, one last question. Um, and then we're gonna take a, a couple more questions from the community if anybody has any more. Um, but um, what is something that you want to make sure everyone knows about Grizzlies and takes home? Oh man, just um, you don't, don't believe the Hollywood portrayal of grizzly bears. They're not bloodthirsty, lurking, horrible, hungry animals. They are, they are just amazing to watch. If you, if you're lucky enough to get somewhere uh, in the back country away from a road and you can see a bear on the other side of a valley and just sit there with binoculars and watch it do its thing in the wild. That is, uh, as the ultimate. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, they are, yeah, it, I don't even know how to explain it. They're just super cool. They're, they have their own little, um, hierarchy, you know, even within the, you know, the sow and cub group, but, you know, also the, the sow and boars hanging out, you know, in close proximity have their own hierarchy. It's a neat little uh, community to watch if you're lucky enough to be able to, to hang out and, and see that. So That's amazing. Well, we're so proud that we get to be part of this um, and to join you officially as a Zoo Parks partner and just to watch your work. I hope we all can kind of come out there um, and see the scene soon. Um, and we're going to behave ourselves, right, everybody? All 120 of us are going to be so well behaved when we go, for sure. All right, I have a little um, gift for you, Mark. Oh. Here we go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Erin. Hi, I'm Erin. I'm one of the primary keepers of the Bears at Oakland Zoo, and I just wanted to say thank you, Mark, and Grizzly National Park for saving Grizzlies. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, let's let's do a final toast unless someone has one more question. Or Mark, we can ask you so humbly to let us say hello to your co-star. Ah, she's right over here. We can bring her over. Hold on just a second. Come here. You know, we're animal people. Yeah. Come here. You can up here. Come, on. Come say hi. Right here. Right here. And there is the famous. Gracie. Oh my God. Somebody get a screenshot. She, <laughs> she makes you look great. Oh, she does. <laughs> All right. She's amazing. Um, well, let's wrap up with a final toast for you both. Thanks for all you do. Not for you. And thank you. <laughs> um, have an amazing night. You do. Thank you for having me. You bet. Right.